commit sin. And people try and explain that as well. This means you won't habitually sin. You'll even see some of the translations that say that. That's not what it's talking about because, you know, did you know that if you're overweight, it's habitual sin? I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. Did you know you can't get fat over eating one meal? You could eat until you pass out. You might gain a pound or two. But if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 plus pounds overweight, you habitually sin. Thank you for that thunder silence. The Bible lists gluttony right next to adultery and lying and stealing and drunkenness. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I'm just saying that if you sit there and define habitual sin, you can't get fat. You can't be overweight without habitual sin. So if you're going to say that 1 John chapter 3, where it says, whosoever is born of God cannot commit sin, and you're going to define that as habitual sin, well, then a person that's fat couldn't be saved. And that's not true. A person who continually gossips can't be saved. A person who is continually depressed can't be saved. A person who is habitually fearful couldn't be saved. A person who habitually worries couldn't be saved. That's not what it's talking about. The way to understand this, the only part of you that's born of God is your spirit and it can not sin. Your spirit doesn't sin. If you sin, your body sins, and you sin in your mind and in your emotions, but your spirit doesn't sin. As Jesus is right this moment, so are you in the spirit. And it says, I'm just, man, I'm talking as fast as I can. I'm going to quote some of these, and you can go look them up. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. The Greek word for one there is hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It doesn't mean that we're similar, we're parallel, that here's God and here we are in our little human spirit. No, it means we are a singular one to the exclusion of another. Your born again spirit is ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule, if there are those kind of things in the spirit realm, identical to Jesus. Most Christians don't believe that. They think I got a little baby spirit and I got to grow my spirit. I hadn't got time to explain that. But you weren't given a baby spirit that has to grow. Your spirit is identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are you. Do you think Jesus is still growing? Jesus is complete. Your spirit's not growing. The part of you that's growing is your mind. I'm not trying to minister to your spirit tonight. Your spirit's perfect. Your spirit has the mind of Christ in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. See, that's another verse that people have a disconnect and they think, I got the mind of Christ and they search this little peanut-sized brain up here and, and they think, this is the mind of Christ? No, it's not... It's not this mind, it's this mind. You've got a mind in your spirit and you know all things. First John chapter two, verse 20 says that we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. See, most people again are carnal and they think only in the physical realm. And so they search their mind and they say, I know all things. You can't even find your glasses and they're on top of your head. And we think, I can't, I don't know all things. What does this mean? It's not talking about your brain up here. It's talking about in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ and you know all things. Your spirit knows everything that Jesus knows. You have the mind of Christ. If we really believe that, we wouldn't sing these songs about further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Man, we can understand it right now. Man, I've got a great teaching on this. It takes about an hour and a half, but this is why you pray in tongues. When you pray in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 says, your spirit prays. When I say spirit, I'm pointing right here because in John chapter seven, it says out of your belly 
shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit that they that believed upon him would receive. So your spirit, according to that scripture, is in your belly. Some of us look like we have more of the spirit than others, but it's not true, praise God. But when you pray in the spirit, you are praying. When you pray in tongues, you are praying in the spirit, the part of you that has the mind of Christ and knows all things. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. So anytime you have a need, all you got to do is say, Father, thank you that I have an unction from you and I understand all things, not in your brain, but in your spirit. All I got to do is draw it out. How do I draw it out? When I pray in tongues, I'm praying in the spirit and I'm going to pray that I interpret. So you start praying in tongues and ask God for an interpretation and boy, God will start giving you wisdom. I could give you thousands and thousands of examples of how I've done this when I need wisdom and I start praying in tongues and boom, God shows me something. Man, if you don't pray in tongues, it's like fighting the devil with both hands tied behind your back. You need to pray in tongues because it just really, it's like flipping a switch that turns on the spirit realm. It's powerful. When you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful is what it says. First Corinthians 14, 13. And if you are carnal and being controlled and dominated by your physical, natural realm, your mind, when you pray in tongues, it makes no sense to your brain for you to continue to pray in tongues. You've got to get into the spirit realm. And that's why it builds you up on your most holy faith. Praying in tongues is like finding the switch to the power of God and just flipping it and turning it on. And you can pray in tongues and pray that you interpret. I got a great teaching on that, about two hours worth of teaching. It's awesome. So anyway, your spirit is identical to him. And somebody says, well, I, I just don't believe, I don't believe that. Well, it says in Romans chapter eight, verse nine, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you say, I don't have that, well, then you aren't his. We'll give an invitation and you can be born again tonight. But if you are born again, whether you know it or not, your spirit is identical to Jesus. You know, if we really believe that, you would not settle for the substandard life that most Christians settle for. The reason most Christians, when the doctor says you're going to die and you just fall apart like a $2 suitcase is because you don't believe that you have the same spirit on the inside of you that raised Christ from the dead. And you say, but I'm only human. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. One third of me is exactly like Christ. And because of it, I do not submit to stuff that's just normal. And I know many of you are thinking, that's weird. I think you're weird. <laughs> I think you're weird to be a born again person and to be as he is, so are you. He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit and yet you're going around having the same fear, the same uh, worries, the same care as people that don't know the Lord. Did you know when 2008, 2009 came along and they had the quote unquote great recession Christians were just as fearful as believers. Now, again, I know that Mac teaches a lot on prosperity and this group probably isn't quite typical, but I, I could just guarantee you, you can't get this many people in a church and have everybody on the same page. There are some of you that got to worrying and you planned on defeat and you started cutting back and fearing lack just the same as people that didn't know the Lord. That's wrong. God said he'd supply your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Our, our, uh, our standard is the riches in glory, not this earth economy. Amen. Did you know when the great recession happened is when the Lord told me I was thinking too small and I had to think bigger. And so right in the middle of the great recession, we started expanding and I just finished a $32 million building debt free. I've got a $53 million building that's halfway paid for uh, debt free. And we are, 
We are in the process of building like a $250 million campus above our normal expenses all during the Great Recession. We doubled our income in 2009 while everybody else was cutting back. And you know why? Because I, I'm not limited to what I see and feel. I'm going by what the Word of God says, who I am in Christ. It's wrong for you to fear and have the same phobias and the same problems that your neighbor that doesn't know the Lord has. There should be a difference between us and a person that's dead. And I'm saying this in love, but brothers and sisters, there's some of you that if you were arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. You have the same fear. You get the same sickness. You have the same financial problems. You have the same mindset as people that don't even know the Lord. And it's because, again, you're carnal. You are thinking only in the natural realm instead of seeing who you are in Christ. Once you see who you are in Christ and what you have, it just changes the way you do things. When the Lord showed me this, I was in the Baptist church and I had been told that miracles ceased with the apostles and that they didn't have miracles today. But once I saw these truths, did you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I knew that if I had the same power that raised Christ from the dead living on the inside of me, then miracles were still for us today. And I started praying and I saw people healed. I saw all kinds of miracles. And as far as I knew, it was the first miracle that had happened in 2000 years. I'd been told that they all quit. And yet I still believed in miracles before I heard of, I ever heard of Copenhagen, Copeland and Hagen. <laughs> I'd never heard of them. And I saw miracles happen before I heard anybody else was doing it just because I found out who I was in Christ Jesus. And man, I started believing God and things started happening. Amen. Somebody might be saying, well, I can accept that when I got born again, that those things were true, but you don't understand, man, I've blown it, I've sinned, and I've, I've corrupted it. And, and see, a lot of people think that when you sin falls short, that somehow or another it corrupts your spirit. Look at this verse over in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to say some things right here that will blow you out of the water if you haven't heard this. But in Ephesians chapter 1, Verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So all of these verses I've used, you were created in righteousness and true holiness. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. He that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. You're identical, ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule. That happens at salvation. And then according to this verse, the moment you believe, you are sealed. You know, there's different types of sealed. You can put a stamp, a seal of approval on something and show that it's been inspected. But there's also a seal that's talking about like when a woman cans preserves or something, you put it in a jar and then you seal it with paraffin or something so no airborne impurities can get in. This is talking about a seal. You are vacuum packed the moment you believe and the Holy Spirit seals, encases your spirit so that you were created righteous and truly holy and it never changes. Even if you sin, Sin will penetrate your body and it'll give Satan access to your body. Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, you yield to the person who inspired that sin, Satan. And Satan, if you give him that kind of inroad, it says he only comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. If you yield to Satan through your sin, he will come into your physical body and eat your lunch and pop the bag. <laughs> you can tell our Bible college students, all of them know that. <laughs> but 
You don't want to yield to Satan because it'll give him access to your physical body and it'll give him access to your mind and your emotions. And you will suffer because of sin. But your spirit is sealed. It doesn't change your spirit. It doesn't penetrate the seal around your spirit. Your spirit retains its righteousness and holiness even when you sin. And because of this, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is why you have to learn who you are in Christ. And when you approach God, you have to approach him based on who you are in Christ, not based on your actions. If you come and you are really bold and God, I know you're going to use me because I've been fasted and praying. I went to church and I gave big in the offering and I know you're going to bless me. You're approaching him in the flesh and you are unacceptable. But on the other hand, if you approach him in the spirit, you could have come and just sinned and you could still come boldly before the throne of grace if you approach him in spirit because your spirit isn't contaminated by your sin. It's not stained. Now, see, this is where some people take grace and they begin to start going to an extreme. Man, my spirit's saved. It's sealed. I can get by with anything. Well, first of all, the Bible says, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Beloved, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Verse two says, beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And verse three says, and every man or woman, every person that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. If anybody is listening to me tonight and says, man, this is awesome. I can go live in sin. This is my ticket to go live for the devil. You need to get born again. Because if you had this hope in him, you aren't looking for an excuse to sin. You want to live for God. You might be doing a poor job of it because religion, law will actually strengthen sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. It actually makes sin come alive. Romans chapter seven, I believe it's verse nine. The law will actually make you sin and it'll give sin dominion over you. Romans chapter six, verse 14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law, but under grace. If you are under the law, you actually are empowering sin in your life. Grace will break the dominion of sin. So if anybody is taking what I'm saying and saying, man, this is awesome. I can go live in sin. You don't have this hope in you or you would purify yourself. Amen. I am not encouraging sin. I'm just saying that when you got born again, this righteousness and holiness and your position in Christ is not conditional. It doesn't fluctuate based on your performance. If it did... If you could corrupt your spirit, if you could defile your spirit through your actions, then you know what? The moment you got born again, I'd kill you. <laughs> I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven is if I just killed you the moment you became holy and pure because I can guarantee you, you are going to mess up. And somebody said, well, but you get them all confessed. Do you really think that you've confessed everything? Some of you are thinking things about me right now that you don't even know are wrong, but you need to confess it. I'm your brother in the Lord, and you're thinking about things about me that, you know, don't please God. Amen. <laughs> you, anyway, man, you are sanctified and perfected forever, forever. Let me share this with you. You need to read this out of your Bible or you wouldn't believe this is in the Bible. Look over in Hebrews chapter nine. I wish I had time to put this in its context. It's even more powerful if you understand the context of this. But in Hebrews chapter nine, it's contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. Under the old covenant, every time a person sinned, it broke relationship with God and they had to offer a new sacrifice. But under the new covenant, that's not true. It's the opposite. And this is the point that he's making in Hebrews chapter nine. 
And in verse 12, it says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Again, if you take this in its context, it's showing under the old covenant, every time you sinned, you had to have a new offering for sin. You had to get that sin under the blood. You had to reapply the blood. You had to go through a cleansing process. But under this new covenant, he entered in once. If you were to study this, there are five times in this chapter that this contrast is made. The Old Testament was every time you sinned, you had to get re-cleansed. In the new covenant, once, once you were cleansed. And notice what it says, that you received eternal redemption. Did you know if words mean anything, this means you got eternal redemption. Not redemption till the next time you sinned. Eternal redemption. This is radical. This changed my life. This changed my life because even after I began to understand that God, you did something special, you made me brand new, I was recreated, I thought, well, you gave me this precious gift, but man, I've blown it, I've corrupted it, and I saw myself as somehow or another defiled and never quite where I was supposed to be. But once I started understanding that I was totally his workmanship, it didn't have anything to do with me. I was created righteous and truly holy. Once I began to understand this and then understand that I was sealed and that one sacrifice gave me eternal redemption, it changed my whole relationship with God. It didn't make me want to go sin more. It made me want to sin less. Because now, man, God had given me such a great gift. I don't want to go out here and not enjoy it by yielding myself to the devil. Now, I'll say some things here that most pastors won't say. I'm sure Pastor Lynn and uh, Mac will love me anyway. But did you know what? If you never came to church again, God would love you the same. Most people believe I've got to go to church and do all this. No, you don't. God loves you based on who you are in the spirit. But... If you don't go to church, you're stupid. <laughs> it's not that God doesn't love you. It's just that you're stupid because you aren't going to hear somebody telling you this good news. You're going to be sitting there watching as the stomach turns on the television and listening to stuff that pollutes you. You need to come here for your edification. Coming to church changes your heart towards God. It doesn't change God's heart towards you. So if you never came to church again, and if you were truly born again, God would love you the same. But you're stupid. But I'm trying to say God loves you, stupid. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make God love you more, and you can't make God love you less. But there's a lot of stuff you can do that'll make you love God less. You go out and yield to sin and don't get around believers and don't study the word and don't pray. You won't love God the same. And you're just stupid if you do that. But God loves you, stupid. He loves you the same. Your spirit is just the same. But it's just wrong. Why would you want to do that? If anybody really understood, if you had, a, if you had a, even a glimpse of what Jesus has done for you, you would be so excited, so in love with him that you'd give up bubble gum if you thought it would please him. Man, you'll do anything. People that are sitting there saying, well, what can I get by with? You don't know what Jesus has done for you. Man, I'm not trying to see what I can get by with. There's a lot of things I could do, but I don't want to do them. Man, I want to live for God. So. By one offering, he gave you eternal redemption. In verse 15, it says, And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. They which, which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 
eternal inheritance. If words mean anything, what part of eternal inheritance do we not understand? And yet we've been taught that we are forgiven up until the next sin. And then you got to get that sin confessed and under the blood. And if you don't, you can die and go to hell. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> Somebody's sitting here, so you're one of those once saved, always saved guys. Not exactly. I believe that you can renounce your salvation. I don't believe you can send it away. If you could send it away, tell me which sin is it that would qualify? Well, you have to start saying there's certain sins that are acceptable and certain that aren't. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. If you're going to say that sin can send you to hell, well, then any sin could send you to hell. That's not what this is teaching. Your sins have been forgiven. You don't lose your salvation because of sin. You could renounce it one time, Hebrews chapter 6. I'm sorry to even mention this because I hadn't got time to explain it. But this is what Hagen taught. You can renounce your salvation one time, but if you do, there is no such thing as repentance. And only a mature Christian can do that. An immature Christian can't do it. But you can't sin your salvation away. Your sins, you got eternal redemption eternal inheritance. It's eternal. A person that believes every time you sin, you lose everything that God has done in your life. There's no way you're ever going to mature. You're never going to go anywhere because you're going to blow it all the time. Sin is not only what you're supposed to do, or excuse me, sin is not only these commandments that you can't do things, but it says in Romans 14, 23, to him that knows to do good, and does it not to him it is sin. Or excuse me, I think that's James 4, 17. Romans 14, 23 says, uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You take either one of those verses, and I guarantee you there's times that all of us aren't in faith. There's times that we don't do the good that we're supposed to do. All of us sin constantly. And if you think that you lose your right standing with God, Every time you sin, then you are going to be one messed up person that has no confidence, no boldness, because your own conscience is going to be condemning you constantly. It changes everything when you understand that this is talking about your spirit. Your spirit was cleansed, created in righteousness and true holiness. It's identical to Jesus. It's one with him, and then it's vacuum packed, sealed. And when you sin... Sin will give Satan an inroad into your physical body and into your soulish realm, but it doesn't penetrate the seal around your spirit and you still have access to the throne room if you will worship him in spirit and in truth. And instead of running from God and feeling so unworthy, you can run right into the very throne room of God and say, oh God, I blew it. The devil's on my case. I'm the one that gave him the opportunity but thank you for your forgiveness and you can boldly go in there instead of being separated. Amen. Again, I wish I had time to go through all of these verses, but you read it down here in verses 24 through the end of the chapter. It just makes this thing that the priests go in all of the time and are offering sacrifices. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, four sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. Jesus is not in heaven reapplying the blood every time you sin and trying to get your sin under the blood. Can you imagine how many millions of Christians there are around the world that sin every single day, multiple times every single day, and every single day, oh God, I've sinned, please get this sin under the blood. Jesus would have to be, there'd be no seating at the right hand of the Father. He would be standing, working 24 hours a day, amen purging everybody's sin. Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever, and he's now seated at the Father's right hand. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. For the law having a good a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therein too perfect. Again, he's continuing this comparison. The Old Testament didn't ever cleanse anybody. It was only symbolic. And, it, and that's the reason they had to offer those sacrifices over and over because they were only types and shadows. It wasn't the real deal. 
In verse two, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? If the sacrifices in the Old Testament would have really purged anything, they'd have quit offering them. But they kept offering them over and over and over. It says, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. The Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do it because they were only types and shadows, but the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus did do it, and because of it, you should have no more conscience of sin. You should not be sin conscious. That's nearly heresy to the average Christian. The average Christian thinks that being sin conscious and unworthy conscious and, oh God, we are so unworthy. We come before you so humbly. We don't deserve anything. We think that that's actually a godly thing. You know, if you feel, I heard Kenneth Copeland say this, if you feel like a gnat on the back of an elephant when you come before God, instead of talking about how sorry and puny you are, talk about how big God is to love somebody as sorry and puny as you, amen? <laughs> but see, we will just sit here and focus on our sin and our failure and, oh God, all of these things. Man, you ought to focus on God. You are so awesome to accept somebody like me, to give me eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. And you should not be focused on your sin, but instead focused on the one who has forgiven you of all of your sin. Take a deep breath. He's forgiven you of all sin, past, present, and even future sin. Sin that you hadn't even committed yet have already been forgiven. And somebody says, somebody says, how can God forgive a sin before I commit it? Well, you better hope that he can because he only died for your sins one time 2,000 years ago before you ever committed them. I don't know how God does it, but he forgave all of your sins, past, present, and even sins that you haven't committed yet are forgiven. You know, my sister, she's nine years older than me, and she's a, she's a great lady. She saw a person raised from the dead in the back of her car one time, choked on gum, and died. My sister raised her from the dead. She knows the Lord, but she has a daughter that could make any believer cuss. <laughs> she is the most rebellious, one of the most rebellious kids I've ever seen. And anyway, when she was a kid... She's 12 or 13. My sister was fixing supper. Her husband was a professor at Oklahoma Baptist University. And so he was bringing somebody over and my sister was fixing supper. She was busy in the kitchen and my niece was just ragging on her and giving her a hard time and saying bad stuff. And, and anyway, long story, but my sister just lost her temper and decked her daughter, <laughs> knocked her flat of her back. And after she did it, she ran upstairs, threw herself across the bed, and she said, God, you've got to speak to me. If I start crying, I won't come out of here until tomorrow morning. I've got to have a word. I've got to fix supper. I've got to somehow or another get over this. And the Lord just spoke to her and he said, Joyce, when you got born again at eight years old, I knew you were going to do this. I've already forgiven you. It's okay. And you know what that did? That didn't make her go down and slap her daughter again because after all, it's forgiven. No, but it enabled her to deal with it. And she went down and asked her daughter to forgive her and she was able to finish supper and go ahead. But see there, most people believe that every time you sin, somehow or another, this is a new infraction between you and God and like, how could God love me after I did this? When you came to him, he knew every rotten thing you would ever do and he forgave you of all sin, past, present, and even the sins you hadn't committed yet. They were all atoned for. They're all under the blood. So Hebrews chapter 10 talks about that, that God put into effect a last will and testament. And look at this in verse 10. It says, by the which will we are sanctified. The word sanctified means to set apart or to make holy. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once. You are sanctified, made holy once. 
Not every time you sin. Once. Once for all. Some people have said, well, that means once for all people, not once for all time. Well, let's just keep reading and I'll show you. It means once for all time. In verse 11, it again makes this same contrast. The Old Testament, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This isn't talking about just one sacrifice for everybody, but one sacrifice forever. The Lord does not have to re-save you, reapply his blood. You don't lose your right standing with God with, when you sin because it was your spirit that was made in right standing with God. It's your spirit that was created in righteousness and true holiness. Then it's vacuum packed, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And because of this, God is a spirit. God is looking at you in the spirit and you can come before him in spirit and in truth and worship him even when you have sinned and blown it. And the only reason that we don't benefit from this is because we don't know the truth. The truth sets us free and our conscience gets defiled and you are condemning yourself. With most of us, it's not even the devil condemning us. He taught us how to condemn ourselves, and then we're doing a bang up job. He can go on vacation. You're just condemning yourself. But it says that he offered this one sacrifice for sins forever. And now he is set down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool for by one offering, notice again, one offering, not many offerings, not every time you sin offering, but by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says you were sanctified by the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. And verse 14 says if you were sanctified, you are perfected forever. Is that talking about your physical body? No, your physical body is not perfect. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Is that talking about your mind? No, your mind, your emotions, your uh, feelings are not perfect. They fluctuate and you, you have messed up and you will mess up again. But in your spirit, you have been sanctified and perfected forever. Your spirit is as perfect and pure right this moment as it will be a million years from now in eternity. Your spirit is not going to have to be dusted off, cleansed, injected with some of the power of God. Somehow or another cleansed from defilement. Your spirit is perfect right now. There's so many scriptures that say this, but right here's one of them. You've been sanctified and perfected forever. Your spirit's as perfect right now as it will ever be. The problem in the Christian life isn't your spirit. You don't need to get the word into your spirit. Your spirit has the mind of Christ. It has an unction from the Holy One and knows all things. I'm trying to get the word into your little peanut brain. It's through the renewing of your mind that the power of God is released. Your spirit is perfect. But our mind is like a valve. You know, Mac, uh, Mac has used this illustration a couple of times about turning the valve. This is something I use. If you could right now imagine a pipe over my head and over here is the spirit. And in the spirit, you're sanctified and perfected forever. You're as holy and pure as Jesus is. You have his mind, his wisdom, his faith, his power, love, joy, and peace. Everything that you could ever want, anything that Jesus purchased is in the spirit over here. And here's the spigot where it comes out. But your mind is the valve. Your mind is the thing that controls it. And if you are sitting here feeling unworthy and, oh God, I know you can do anything, but you have done nothing. But you could do it. And if I would live holy and if I will pray and if I will fast, then maybe you will see your mind just shut off the flow of the Spirit of God. You could have all of this life of God in the spirit and not one drop of it comes out into your physical body because of stinking thinking. And your thinking just closes the valve. But when you begin to understand who you are in Christ and that, Father, I don't, I don't need you to come and break through the heavenlies. You're already inside of me. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead already lives on the inside of me. It's not out there, it's here. The supernatural, miraculous healing power of God is inches away from the cancer that's killing you. But it's, to get out, it's got to come through your brain. It's got to come through the way you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. You got to get your mind renewed and quit thinking that, oh God, would you please move? Am I holy? Uh, God, would you please cleanse me of this? And you've got to become worthy. Your spirit was just created in righteousness and holiness. You've already got it. And as quickly as you can renew your mind, you can turn that valve and release this supernatural power of God. But if you're out living in sin, sin corrupts your mind. Sin keeps you from believing. Sin will make you stupid. Sin is stupid. It's stupid to live in sin. It's brain dead. I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? Just to go out and live in sin is crazy. Look over in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. This will show you. See, some people still struggle and they say, I'm not perfect. Why? Because you go look in the mirror and you see all kinds of imperfections. You search your mind and you just see failure after failure and weakness after weakness. And you think, how can this be? It's because you're carnal. You're trying to find it in the carnal realm. It's the spirit part of you that is perfect. And right here, it proves it. Remember that this is the same author that is writing. Men put the chapter and verse divisions in here so for our reference sake. There's nothing wrong with that. But this isn't a new thought. It's not a new chapter. I mean, it's a new chapter according to our divisions, but it's, he's not saying anything new. This is the same guy talking. It's the same context. And look at what he says right here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This just tells you real clearly what he's talking about. It's the spirit that was made perfect. Your body's not perfect. You got to get a new body. We've got a glorified body coming. Your soul's not perfect. Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we only know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then we will know all things, even as also we are known. Your soul's not perfect yet, but your little spirit is perfect. It's identical to Jesus. It's as pure and holy as Jesus is. It has his righteousness, his power. Therefore, when you come before the Lord and say, in the name of Jesus, and you step into the spirit, you have as much authority as Jesus has. You have as much power as Jesus has. You have access to all of his wisdom and his ability. And you've got to get rid of this mindset that, well, that was Jesus and this is me. I can't relate. Uh, Jesus healed everybody and Jesus did miracles, but who am I? If you are born again, you are identical to Jesus in your spirit. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. This is why he said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, verily, verily, that means truly, truly. Everything Jesus said was the truth. When he had to qualify it by saying, I'm telling you the truth, I'm telling you the truth. It was because he was about to say something that was beyond human belief and he had to qualify. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father. If you believe on him, you've got the same power on the inside of you. It's not out there someplace that you got to pray it down somehow or another, become worthy and earn it, gain it. It's already in you. Are you going to acknowledge it and release it? Philemon chapter one, verse six, Paul prayed a prayer for Philemon, his friend. And he says, I pray that the communication of your faith become effectual. The word effectual means it begins to work by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. He didn't pray like we pray. Oh God, please give me more power. Oh God, pour out your anointing. Double portion. <laughs> 
You know what? Elisha had a double portion of Elijah, but that's because neither one of them had the fullness of the Spirit. You can't get a double portion. You got the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. You are identical to Jesus, and there isn't any double portion night for a New Testament believer. Now, in a sense, you could get twice as much manifest as what you've got manifest, but you've already got it. You got the fullness of the Godhead in you. You've already got everything. You are sanctified and perfected forever. And the only thing that is missing is your acknowledgement of what you have in Christ Jesus. If you could ever see who you are and what you have, I can guarantee you, you would not roll over and let the devil beat you up and do the things to you that he's been doing. If you understood what I was talking about, you would not sit here and say, but I'm fighting cancer. Would you please pray for me? And people come up to me so pitiful, like it's stage four, it's ALS. They told me that. And you just somehow or another try and solicit sympathy and present it as if you are just absolutely pitiful. And you really are. <laughs> It's because you don't know who you are. The truth is ALS, cancer, AIDS, anything is inferior to who you are in the spirit. You need to get a superiority attitude and say in the name of Jesus, I'm not letting this stuff dominate me. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine and he was... I forgot what we, he was sick with something. And anyway, he says, so I, I, you know, have you had the flu? And I said, I had, I hadn't been sick in 47 years. I don't believe in getting sick. And he just looked at me. I said, I don't believe in getting sick. And it's like, you can't do that. And I said, well, don't wake me up because that's the way I'm living. I don't believe in getting sick. I don't get sick. I know some of you just, well, I don't believe that. Well, it won't work for you. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I, I am not perfect in the, I actually have been sick, but it wasn't, it wasn't a normal sickness. I went out and preached 40 times one week, and then I preached 41 times the next week, and I was so tired, I had to crawl to bed. I couldn't walk. And I laid in bed for 24 hours and felt pretty good after that. So I went out and split a cord of wood and I did too much too quick and I got a sinus infection and I laid in bed for two or three days. But I liken that to stupidity, not sickness, amen. I'm, I am mortal and I've got to learn how to cooperate. But other than that, I just don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. You don't have to get sick. And I know many of you don't agree with that, but that's the reason you're sick. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you, you know, when we get to heaven, it says he's going to wipe all tears away from our eyes. And I don't believe that's because we're all going to limp into heaven and we just barely got there and we have bandages all over us and Satan has just beat us up. I believe it's because when we stand in front of him, it says that we are going to know all things, even as we are known. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 17 or 18, it says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Not revealed to us, but revealed in us. When we get before God and we know all things as we are supposed to know, and we're going to realize... I had the raising from the dead power on the inside of me the whole time. I had the creator of the universe in me, the one who opened up blinded eyes and deaf ears. And then you see the beggarly existence that we live down here. There's going to be a lot of weeping and wailing and crying and God's going to have to wipe away tears from our eyes because when we realize that I just lived below my privileges... We're letting people around us die. We're being tormented and, and terrorized by the devil when the truth is, man, you're the one that ought to be taking it to the gates of hell. We aren't holding on and trying to defend our thing. We're, it says the gates of hell will not prevail against us. 
We need to be attacking the devil. We need to be chasing him. I had somebody tell me, don't talk that way. The devil will hear it. <laughs> Satan's going to come after you. And I said, I hope he comes after me. If he turns around and, and, and you know, waits long enough, I've been chasing him. And he turns around, I'll cut his head off with the word of God. Amen. I'm pursuing the devil. I'm not in a defensive position. I'm in an offensive position, fighting the devil. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God has done everything for you that is necessary for you to be a 100% absolute world overcomer. It is not God's fault. It's not time for us to beg him to do something new. It's time for us to acknowledge what he's already done. And if you start realizing this and understanding that he sees you in the spirit, and the part of you that you are so upset with and so disappointed and so so uh, condemned over. God doesn't even see you that way. He sees you in the spirit and you are his workmanship. He looks at you and he's pleased. God thinks you're awesome. The Lord carries a picture of you in his wallet. He's got an eight by 10 of you on his mantle. God thinks you're awesome. And if you could see yourself in Christ and knew that there was no displeasure and that all of his ability and power and everything he's done is not just for Mac or Lynn or somebody else, but it's for you, your faith would go through the roof. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But the word resist means to actively fight against. And most Christians are just, oh God, please get the devil off my case. That's, that's an indication that you don't know who you are and what God's done for you. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you've got the supernatural God power on the inside of you. You've got to go to believing that. The first step in releasing it is believing you've got it. And most of us believe it's off in the future when we all get to heaven. What a day that's going to be. In the sweet by and by, it's going to be awesome. But in the rough now and now, it's just pitiful. <laughs> but you need to recognize that right now you are the righteousness of God. Right now, your spirit is sanctified and perfected forever. It's never going to change. And the only thing that's stopping this... Basically talking about that most people have settled for less than God's best. And that's not good. There's no way that you can receive God's best accidentally. You have to pursue it. And that's what I was encouraging us to do last night. And I also talked about that it's a matter of receiving it, not getting God to give it. God has already done it. It's just that we have to, first of all, desire the things of God, seek with all of our heart before we find it. And then we need to take our authority and release and receive what God has already done. Then this morning, I started contrasting two different ways that God can touch your life. One is through a miracle, and one is through a blessing. And most Christians, especially spirit-filled Christians, <clears throat> just think, oh man, I want to see the miracles of God. Actually, it's better to receive from God by a blessing than it is a miracle. Because if you are going to have a miracle, you've got to have a crisis first. God does not supersede or suspend natural or spiritual laws unless there is a very good reason and it's a crisis reason. And I could go in scripture and show you crisis after crisis that this was the only time that miracles happened. You have to have a crisis first. So if you're going to live from miracle to miracle, you're going to live from crisis to crisis. That's not the way that God wants us to live. A blessing, on the other hand, will prevent crisis. For instance, which would you rather have? Would you rather be able to believe God and stand and confess the word, and after two years of believing, somebody just gives you a new car? That would be awesome, right? You know what's better? To be so blessed, if you want a new car, just go buy one. Pay cash for it and get it over it. It's one thing to believe for your needs to be sp supernaturally men. I talked about that this morning, and for a period of time, Jamie and I had, it was my fault, not Jamie's, but we had to live off of miracles. But you know what? Now we live in the blessing of God. 
And I'd rather live under the blessing of God rather than to have to have a miracle every single day. And we had a lot of them. It's better not to even need a miracle. So a blessing will prevent a crisis. A miracle demands a crisis. A miracle is only temporary. A blessing, once it's given, is eternal. I'll minister on that tomorrow morning. And I tell you, that is something that will change your life if you can understand that. And also a miracle is never as abundant as a blessing. A miracle is just going to be enough to get you by. And then you'll need another miracle. So I contrasted blessings as, and miracles as being two different ways of God being able to meet your need. And if you're in a situation where you need a miracle, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting miracles down. I'm actually trying to elevate blessings and say that God wants to bless you and provide so much for you that, you know, which would you rather have the ability to get healed when something bad happens or to be so blessed that no plague comes nigh your dwelling and you never get sick? See, this is a new wrinkle in a lot of people's brains. They, they just say, well, you can't live that way. You can. The Bible talks about living in divine health so that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. You know, John G. Lake was a minister in the early 1900s. He actually was in part of the 1800s, 1900s. And John Lake saw great, great miracles happen. He had a school where he trained what he called practitioners, and he sent them out. And he told them, don't come back until they're healed. They didn't just pray for a person. They got them healed. And anyway, that's a whole other teaching. But he saw a lot of miracles happen. And they had a plague. I think it was the bubonic plague. I'm not sure. But uh, I think it was the bubonic plague. And he had actually shut down one hospital in Spokane, Washington because so many people got healed. They had two hospitals, one was closed. Spokane, Washington was awarded the healthiest city in the United States for decades because John G. Lake's ministry was located there. He saw great miracles of healing and some tremendous things happen. And anyway, during this plague, he was helping the doctors because he, was, he saw more people healed than the doctor saw healed. So he was helping the doctors with this plague People were dying right and left, and they were putting, they had a makeshift morgue, I think, in a gymnasium. And anyway, a man just died, convulsed, foamed at the mouth, and died. And one of the doctors looked over at John G. Lake and says, man, aren't you glad that we've got a vaccination, an inoculation against this? And John, J., John G. Lake just looked at him and says, who's got an inoculation? And this doctor looked at him and says, you couldn't be helping these people with this plague. If you don't have an inoculation, you'll die. And John Lake said, no germ can touch my body and live. And this, this doctor, of course, didn't believe him. And so he says, I'll prove it to you. And he said, take one of those microscope slides, one of those little glass things. And he says, wipe that foam off this guy's mouth that just died. And they put it under a microscope and you could see all of the germs just moving. And John Lake said, watch this. And he just touched his finger to that spit on that slide and instantly everything was still. And some of you think you can't do that. That's what I want to teach you tonight is that this is one of the blessings spoken that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. There are examples like during the bubonic plague that swept the uh, Europe of, of a, one preacher that got up. And I mean thousands and millions of people were dying. And he stood at the edge of his town because that plague was just sweeping across Europe. And he stood there and said, in the name of Jesus, this plague cannot come in this town. Not a single person in that town got the plague. It went all around them. People think, well, why did God let that happen to everybody? God has given us the power to overcome these things that are on the earth. And if we don't use our power and understand and mix with faith, it says in Hebrews chapter four, verse two, that the word was preached unto them the same as it was, or preached unto us the same as it was preached unto them. But the word preached unto them did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. You have to mix the word with faith. This isn't an amulet. This isn't magic. You don't just hold this under your arm and the miracle power of God flows. 
a lot of Christians really are kind of thinking like uh, vampires. You know, if you hold up the Bible or a cross, they just can't come near you. I think that's so stupid. <laughs> of course, vampires are stupid in the first place, but if there was such a thing as a vampire, I guarantee you he wouldn't cringe at the Bible or at a cross. The devil translated some of the Bibles. He's not afraid of the book. You got to mix faith with this to have its power. If it's not just holding the Bible under you or sticking it on your head, it's not going to release its power. You've got to mix faith with it. And most people have not mixed faith with what the word of God says. And so God has given us this so much power that no plague can come nigh your dwelling. That you can walk in supernatural blessing and see God's blessing come upon you and overtake you. And people think, well, if that's so, then why hasn't it happened? Because you aren't believing for it. We aren't shooting for God's best. We don't understand these things. Most people are living from miracle to miracle, crisis to crisis, instead of finding out about the blessings of God and the spiritual and the natural laws that control the blessings of God. And instead of getting in and cooperating with them, they're just doing things on their own. You know, in the, in the natural realm, people recognize that there are natural laws that you have to follow when you sow a crop. You can't just put the crop in the ground whenever you want to. You can't go out and plant your seed in the dead of winter. You got to wait until the soil starts warming up. There is a right and a wrong time to plant depending upon what you're growing. And then it takes time and you have to water it and you have to give it the right nutrients and different things can affect it. We recognize that in the natural realm, there are natural laws that affect how a crop produces. And all through the Bible, it says, you sow and then you reap, and you reap only what you sow. And the, that same analogy is used in the spiritual realm. And yet Christians just think, well, I prayed and I asked God to heal me. How come I'm not healed? Did you take the word of God and use it like a seed? It says in Proverbs chapter four, that God's word is health unto all of your flesh and life to them that find it. And yet a lot of people, well, I prayed and I asked God, did you take the word that produces health and sow it in your life like a seed? Are you cooperating with the spiritual laws? This morning I talked about honoring your parents causes long life. A joyful heart, merry heart does good like a medicine. Most people ignore those things and they just are living in strife. You know, the Bible says in, a, in uh, James chapter three, verse 16, that where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If you put that together with 1 Corinthians 14, I forget the exact verse, but it says God isn't the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the Lord. So if God isn't the author of confusion, guess who is? The devil. So you put that back with James 3, 16, where envying and strife is, there is confusion, or you could say there is the devil and every evil work. And people don't connect the dots. And they're living in anger. You get mad at the person that cuts you off in traffic and wave at him with one finger and wonder why, why can't I get healed? You know what? You are releasing the devil. Every time you get angry, every time you curse the politician that you don't like and speak bad about people, Every time you gripe and talk about people behind their back, every time you get in a fight at home, you are releasing the force of the devil. It's quietness Presbyterian church. Many of you grew up with strife. You grew up, you know, you had the double standard out in public. You do one thing, but when you get home, man, you let your hair down and anything goes at home. And you wonder why you're having problems at home. You ought to treat people better in your own family than you treat a stranger out in public. You know, my brother, he lives over here in Austin. I went over and saw him on Tuesday. And when he first got married, it was just a few months after they were married, he came home from work and his wife had the crystal and the sterling silver out and the china and the table set. And he says, what's this for? 
And she says, we got company coming over. And says, well, why did you put this? And I says, well, we put out our best for company. You know what my brother did? He got all that and put it up. And he says, from now on, we will use the china and the crystal and the serving sterling silver for our family. And we'll put the other stuff out for the other. Says, we're going to treat our family better than we treat anybody else. That's a good deal. I like that. But most of us just have this that you got to put on the dog. You got to show off when other people come around. And you know what? We say things to your mate that you would never say to me. I've been in people's homes before and stayed with them and I've heard them yell at their child and say, get up there and clean up your room. You sorry thing, make your bed. And they just speak down to them. And then after everybody's off gone to school, they'll say, why am I having trouble with my kids? <laughs> and I've told them before, I said, talk to me the way you talk to your son and see how our relationship goes. <laughs> now that's not to say you don't ever make them do what they need to do, but you know what? We just have this double standard where we allow strife. Many of you grew up with it and you don't understand there are spiritual laws. And if you get into strife, envy and strife, there is the devil and every evil work. Not some of them, everyone. Cancer, sickness, poverty, divorce, strike, anything you want. You just turn the devil loose through your temper and through your selfishness. Come on now. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. There are spiritual laws. And most people see in the natural, you understand that you got to plant at a certain time. It takes time. You got to water it. And we understand, but in the spirit, we think, well, if God's God, God could just do anything. God is the one that created natural and spiritual laws. And he doesn't violate them easily. He saw all of them and said, it's good. And he doesn't want to give you a miracle. He would rather you start cooperating, take care of yourself in the natural and in the spiritual. Walk in love. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things would come upon you. Amen. He gave us guidelines and the problem is we just aren't following them. What I want to talk about tonight, I, I contrasted a blessing and miracle and I want to talk about what is a blessing tonight and help you to understand what a blessing is and how to receive it and how to activate it. And let me first of all make this point. This is really important that you get this. A blessing is not a thing. We will often look at our house and say, that's a blessing. Or this car and say, that's a blessing. Those aren't blessings. Those are the byproducts of a blessing. And the reason it's important for you to realize this is because physical things come and go. You can't control everything out here. You are going to have times where something happens. Like I remember when Jimmy Swaggart and um, Jim Baker went on trial and got exposed for their sins. Did you know that media ministries, my ministry took a 40 to 60% decrease in income when they did what they did? Because people just all of a sudden, fear hit them like, uh-oh, all media ministries are crooks. And they began to start cutting their giving down. And I took a hit. Over 50% of our income left because I didn't do a blooming thing. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. The same thing happens every time there's a hurricane. Did you know when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, did you know that our income from this area went way down? Because people are occupied. They aren't watching the Christian program anymore. They're watching the news to see what's going on. And then they find out about people hurting and they divert their giving towards these benevolence things, which is okay. I'm not against that, but I'm just saying that our income took a hit from this area, from New Orleans and other places, because people were occupied with other things. There's things that can affect you that don't have anything to do with you. And if you think that, oh, the blessing of God is how much money I've got coming in or what kind of house I'm living in or what kind of clothes I'm wearing. If you think that that is the blessing of God, there are times that that will fluctuate and go up and down and then your faith will be affected. But it really helps to understand what the blessing of God really is. Here is a real simple definition of the blessing of God. It is God's divine favor 
spoken over you. Amen. Now I can spend a lot of time explaining that, but it has to be spoken over you. God has grace for everyone, but when you enter into covenant with him, he starts speaking things over you and he starts releasing his divine favor. And this is what the blessing is. Here's another way of saying it. Most people, you know, you remember that old story about the goose that laid the golden egg? Anybody remember that? Most people want the golden egg. But what's really valuable, the golden egg or the goose that lays the golden egg? You know what? A house or a car or money in the bank or something could be considered an asset. And some people look at that and say that's a blessing. But you know what's a real blessing? Is the favor of God that produced all of these material natural things. And once you understand this, then you don't hold and hoard these things that you've got because it doesn't matter if you lose everything you got, you still got the goose. You still got the Lord. You still got the Lord's favor on your life. And the real asset is the blessing, the spoken favor of God over you. And once you understand that and start mixing it with faith, you start a supernatural flow of God's blessing towards you that nothing can stop. I tell you, it'll, it's powerful. And you can come to a place where you're secure. Man, I could teach right here on Luke 16 about the rich man who complimented his servant who stole from him. And he, he was so detached from his things. His things were like walking out the door with his servant and yet he was able to bless him. Not many people could do that because most people are looking at their things as the real asset when the truth is it's not the things, it's the favor of God that produces the things. And once you change from saying this is a blessing and that's a blessing and instead you say, the real blessing is the fact that God is on my side. God has blessed me. God loves me and God is for me and you can strip me of everything I've got and I'll rise to the surface. I'll come back, amen. We had a fire in 2002 out where we lived. It was a drought year and there was 144,000 acres burnt. It started eight miles from our house. It burned within one mile of our house and they evacuated all of our homes. And um, we were out of it for two weeks. And a lot of my neighbors were renting trucks and loading up all of their household goods and leaving because they were afraid that their house would burn down. And Jamie and I just prayed over our house and blessed it and spoke favor over it and said, we believe that it's protected. And as we were leaving, Jamie said, I agree with you and I believe that our house is blessed and that everything's going to be fine. But she says, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just stuff. She says, it wouldn't matter if we lost the whole thing. We had fun getting it. We'd have fun getting it back. It's just stuff. Man, that's a great attitude. And if you've ever seen our house, we got a lot of stuff. It would take one truck to move Jamie's knickknacks and then another truck to move the rest of the house. I mean, this is our dream house. We designed it. We built it. And it's just full of stuff. But you know, it's just stuff. That's the right attitude. And yet there's a lot of people that hoard their stuff and they're afraid to give it away because they think that that is the real blessing of God. It's not. It's the favor of God that has been spoken over you that produces things that's the real blessing. So don't ever get your attention on things and think that this is how I'm blessed because things have a way of leaving, changing, breaking, growing old, needing to be replaced. You need to recognize it's the favor of God spoken over you that is the real blessing. And let me just share some important things here in Proverbs chapter 18 in verse 20. It says, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. You know, I hadn't got time to go through every one of these, but I've actually preached on this verse for an hour and gone through every individual word. Words are important. It's using symbolism and says, you'll be satisfied with the fruit of your mouth. Fruit, that's like you plant a seed and something grows up and you get fruit. In other words, these words that come out of your mouth produce fruit. 
If you would look at it, that every word you say is like spitting seeds. Every word that you say is like spitting a seed out your mouth. And it goes on in the next verse to say, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life. It didn't say death and life and a whole lot of stuff in the middle that doesn't matter. Just idle words, wasted words. Matter of fact, Jesus said this over in Matthew chapter 12 around verse 33, 35 somewhere. He said, every idle word that men speak, they will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. Most of us think words aren't really that important. We have to say things like, I really mean it. When Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. But we say all kinds of things that we don't mean. We promise people things. Say, I'll be there at 7 o'clock. You get there at 7.10, 7.15. They can count on you being late. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but you know what? God is never late. If he says something... The whole universe depends upon him keeping his word. If he says something, he has to do it or the universe would self-destruct. Everything is held together by the power of his word. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He never lies. He never misrepresents. So if you say you're going to be someplace at 7 and you get there at 701, you're ungodly. That word means not like God. If you say we're going to leave at 7.30 and you get out the door at 7.40, you're ungodly. I know some of you think, boy, that's, you're nitpicking. God loves you if you're ungodly. I'm just trying to convince you that you're ungodly, amen, but God loves you. I'm not trying to condemn you, but I'm saying death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you know what? When you say something and don't do it, you're releasing death. When you speak forth your fear... Every time somebody says, how are you doing? And you say, oh, the doctor says I'm dying. The doctor says it's going to get worse. And you talk about how you feel. You just made your situation worse. Death and life, not anything else. It's either death or life. You're either going to release life. You're spitting seeds that are going to produce something that grows positive in your life or you're speaking negative. I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, if I could follow you home and listen to some of you talk and then play it back for you, you shouldn't wonder why your life is in the mess that it is. Some of the things we say, some of the thoughts, and you know, not only the words you say out of your mouth, but as you think, your self-talk will eventually come out. And there are some of you that if you were around me, if I was home with you, you'd be on your best behavior. You'd say, oh, I believe it's getting better. I believe God's working in my behalf. But then you get around some people that don't believe like I do and they say, how are you? And you just ugh, let it all out. <laughs> just throw up all over them, all of your doubt and your unbelief. You're releasing death. You're spitting seeds of death that are going to produce something every time you do that. And remember that a blessing is nothing but God's divine favor spoken over you. The reason I bring this out is to say, if your words and my words are life and death, every word, and let me put a little parenthesis here before I finish that statement, but that's not only true of your words, that's true of every word you listen to. If you watch a show and they're speaking things contrary to the word of God, they're speaking death into you that's impacting you and having an impact on you. When they speak strife, did you know where envy and in strife is? There's confusion in every evil work. And every time you watch a show with strife and hatred in it and people hurting each other, did you know you are opening up a door through their words of putting death in your life? Every time you listen to a song, country and western, somebody running off with another person's wife and sitting on the bar stool and complaining about your pickup and your dog leaving and the Wichita line man still on the line. You're sowing seeds of death and discouragement on the inside of you. 
Every time you hear somebody sing about lusting after this person and going to a bar and, and doing what, I don't know what they are, but all of these songs and stuff, you know what? You're sowing seeds of lust on the inside of you. I know some of you don't like this because it doesn't fit your lifestyle, but I think if you'd be honest, your lifestyle isn't working. <laughs> you're sick, you're poor, you're stressed. You know that there's something more than what you've got. And yet when somebody goes to telling you the truth, oh, I'm not sure I agree with that. You know, if what, you, if you, what you're doing isn't working for you, why don't you listen to somebody that it is working for? Amen. You need to consider what I say. It's important the words that you say, not only the words you say, but the words everybody. And if it's important, the words that we say, and if this be true, that death and life are in the power of our tongue, just think how powerful God's words are. When God speaks something over you, it's powerful. And I think that we lose some of the impact of this because we live in a society where our words don't mean that much. Used to, if you gave somebody your word, you could count on it. You could count on it. Nowadays, you can sign a contract and the contract doesn't mean anything. If you get a good lawyer, he can get you out of it. Depends on what the definition of is, is. <laughs> People don't mean what they say. They, you know, they, they wanted to put some of these recent presidents on Mount Rushmore. But they, they decided they didn't have room for two more faces. <laughs> You'll get that later. I mean, politicians today, they just lie. And it's part of the territory. And because of this... We don't think there's that much power in words, but God, it says in Psalms chapter 89, verse 34, he says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. You meditate on that verse and what he's saying is every time I say something, it's a covenant. It's a contract. God never lies. God never says I'll do something and doesn't come through with it. In that verse that I quoted earlier out of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that Jesus is the express image of his person and the brightness of his glory and um, upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds everything by the word of his power. You know, over in Genesis, if you were to turn over there, there's like 10, 15 times that God said, let there be light. And there was like God created everything tangible that you and I can see out of words. Words are the parent force. You were created by words. This earth, the oxygen you breathe were created by words. That body was created by words. It will respond to words. Words are the parent force. Words created everything. And according to that verse in Hebrews chapter one, verse three, he holds all things together by the power of his word. <clears throat> Do you know if you look at an atom, they say that there's a nucleus with like charged particles and according to every law of physics that we know these like charged particles repel each other. The nucleus should be flying apart and yet it's compacted and held together so tightly that we've only been able to split a few unstable atoms, uranium, plutonium and some things like that. But in a slice of bread, I have read that there is enough energy in the atoms of one slice of white bread to power an ocean liner across the Atlantic Ocean and back. There's all of this power located in the atoms, but you know what? We can't split them. They should be flying apart by everything we understand, but something is holding them together. You know what it is? It's the Word of God. He told them. He created them. He spoke. And the word of God holds the entire universe together. And if God ever broke his word, if he ever said he'd do something and failed to do it, the universe would self-destruct. You and I would self-destruct. The whole thing would go up in smoke. 
As long as we still have the earth intact, it shows that God has never broken his word. When God says something, it's a covenant and he will not break it. He won't alter the thing that has gone forth out of his lips. And there is life and death in the words of God. And a blessing is when he speaks life. And it has supernatural power in it. And yet most people, again, we don't honor words. We don't honor our word. We don't honor the word of other people. And so we forget that God has all of this integrity. And when he says something, so we read these scriptures and it says things like no plague will come nigh our dwelling. And we think, oh, well, wouldn't that be wonderful if that happened? He just said it over you. This is a blessing. It's spoken and life is in that. And the only thing that keeps that life from coming to pass is our lack of faith. Again, Hebrews chapter four, verse two says, the word preached unto us was also preached unto them, but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. God has spoken all of these blessings over us, brothers and sisters. We should be the head only and not the tail, above only and not beneath. And yet you walk up to the average Christian, how are you doing? Well, okay, under the circumstances. You ought to get out from under there. <laughs> you ought to be above only and not beneath. You ought to start taking the word of God and say, I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. That man, I am highly favored. When Mary went to see Elizabeth, she was filled with the Holy Ghost and John the Baptist leapt in her womb and out of prophecy, she didn't know what happened. Mary didn't call her on her cell phone or send her an email. She didn't know what had happened. And without knowing anything in the natural, she started prophesying, saying, blessed is the uh, mother of the Lord. Highly favored. You are blessed among all women. Did you know that that word that was used there when it says you are blessed among all women, you're highly favored. It was only used twice in the Bible. Once when Elizabeth spoke that over Mary and the other time is in Ephesians chapter one, verse six, where it says that you have been blessed. You are highly favored. You are accepted in the beloved is the way it's translated in Ephesians one, six. You have, you have the exact same favor on you that was on Mary, the mother of Jesus. You are blessed, 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 blessed. And yet we haven't accepted it and seen the manifestation of it because we haven't received it. We haven't understood this. Most people don't think about the power of a blessing. Our Western culture doesn't think this way. But you know, in the Eastern culture, the words that you say are very important. And this is the culture that the Bible was written from. And when people said things, I mean, it was a covenant. They would have a blood covenant. They would strike a covenant and enter into covenant. And those covenants were binding. People would die over a covenant. Every time you say something out of your mouth, you're speaking a covenant. You may not know it, but you are releasing either life or death. It says over in Romans chapter 12, I forget the exact verse, but it says, bless and curse not. He told us to bless. Let me just turn over here. I've got it marked. In Romans chapter 12, and in verse, uh, in verse 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. You know why he told you to bless? Because you can bless. You know why he told you not to curse? Because you also curse. Some of you think, oh, I don't curse anybody. Every time you look at somebody and say, they'll never make it. You've cursed them. Every time you say, boy, that person, they, they just are rotten. I, they aren't going to make it. I, you know, I think they're going to die. I don't think they're ever going to get out of these financial bind. You know what? You're releasing a curse. You may not understand that, but it's absolutely true. Some of you are cursed when you were a child. Your parents told you you'd never amount to anything. They'd say, I'm proud of your brother or sister, but you know what? You just, you just don't have it. You know what? They spoke curses over you. It's like a prophecy. And the sad thing is, it'll come to pass unless you cancel it. It says over in Proverbs chapter 26, I believe it is, verse 2 or 3, or maybe, I don't know, it's right there close. 
Matter of fact, I'm over here in Proverbs. Let me just turn over and look this up so I don't misquote it. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. There are curses out here in the world, but you know what? You can negate them if you don't submit to them. You have to yield to them. You know, people curse me all of the time. We've got hundreds of blogs written against me. One of them says, the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> and I have people say terrible things about me and accuse me of things and stuff. But you know what? It can't affect me unless I yield to it, unless I mix it with faith, unless I somehow or another empower it by worrying about it or thinking about it. The curse causeless will not come. But the sad thing is many of us have had people in positions of authority like parents or somebody or a teacher say, you'll never make it. You can't do it. And um, you know what? Many people let that become a curse, just like a governor in your life that hinders you. And, and it has power in it. Words have power. You may not have sat down and thought about it this way, but every person in here has had somebody say something to you that's hurt you and that has hindered you. Many of you have gone through a marriage, divorce or something, and you've had words spoken over you, and you've never gotten over those words. Many of you have had somebody reject you. Many of you have had problems in home or business, or maybe you've had a failure and people have spoken things about you, and your life is still bound by those words. There's power in words. You can break that curse. And one of the ways you break it is to recognize the greatness of a blessing over a curse. Come on. But you're going to have to start putting importance on words. You're going to have to start recognizing that if death and life are in the power of our tongue, and he told us to bless and not curse, then what must it be like when God says something over you? Like, no plague will come nigh your dwelling. He'll give his angels charge over you. You will not dash your foot against a stone. His angels will protect you. And on and on and on it goes. If we would quit transposing our culture and our unbelief about words onto God, but instead go back and study the word the way it's written and see what God says, that he never violates his word. The whole universe is held together by the integrity of his words. Then go through and look at this like a legal document. And if he said something good about you, man, that's it. He will never break this. This is what God says about me. By his stripes, I was healed. That's a blessing that God has put over us. That we will be above only and not beneath the head and not the tail. We will lend unto many nations, but we shall not borrow. They'll come out against me one way and flee seven ways. Man, I am going to prosper, prosper, prosper. These blessings will come upon me and overtake me. But you got to believe it. You got to understand the power of a blessing. You know, over in Genesis chapter one, let me just read a few of these verses to you about where God created the heavens and the earth. And look at this in Genesis chapter one, verse three, and God said, let there be light. Boom. And there was light. You know, this is really interesting. It was the third day before he created the sun. He created light three days before there was a source for the light to come from. We just can't wrap our brain around that. We would have created the sun first and then say, let there be light. But he created light and then created some place for it to come from. Romans chapter four, verse 17 says, God calls those things that be not as though they were. But he spoke light into existence. And then it says in verse 6, And God said, let there be a firmament. And he created the heavens and the sky. In verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And he created the dry land. In verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed. You know, I wish I had time to go through every one of these verses. But if you'll just look at this 11th verse... It says, let the earth bring forth uh, grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. You know, that's real wordy. 
And people read this in the King James and they just think, you know, they just talked weird back then. There's a reason for saying it this way. If he had just said, let there be grass, let there be herbs, let there be trees. Then when that tree died, he had had to create new trees. But he said, let there be herbs that have seed in themselves that can reproduce. He was creating with words the ability to procreate. And because of this, he's never had to create another tree. He's never created another animal. He's never created another everything. He created everything so perfectly and then he rested because it was over. He spoke things. His words are important. There's reasons he said, let the earth bring forth herbs that, whose seed is in itself, who can produce another tree. Man, it's so important, words. There's power in these words. And so then down in verse um, 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. And he created all of the stars and stuff. In verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. And he created all of the creatures that live in the sea. In verse 22, it says, and God blessed them saying. Notice that the way you release a blessing is by words. And here's what he said to these living creatures. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth. You know why animals are able to reproduce? Because God said they could. He blessed them, spoke favor over them. Scientists will say that they've created life. Scientists have never created life. They can take a, a cell that already has God's life in it and they can clone it. They can separate it and start the reproduction thing, but they can't create life. One of the definitions of true life is something has to be able to procreate, reproduce. If it can't reproduce, it's not life. Scientists have never created anything that's able to reproduce. They can't do it because you know why it had the ability to reproduce? Because God said, be fruitful and multiply. And he hasn't said that to anything that a man's created. Life comes from God. It came through a blessing. Life as we know it didn't happen by some big bang or lightning striping, striking a pool of, of uh, what do they call it, slime or amino acids and boy if you believe that I got a bridge I'd love to sell you <laughs> anyway I don't want to get off the subject but it's God's the source of life God said you live you produce life he created it and it came by his words and these same words that spoke everything physical you and me and everything in existence into life those same words are spoken all throughout the Bible that all it takes is your faith to release the power that's in that and start understanding the power of a blessing. Down in verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature and he created all of the animals that move upon the earth and he blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. In verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God created us by words. And in verse 26, God blessed them. And God said, this is how a blessing is released, is by words. You have to speak it into existence. He spoke the blessing of God. So the point I'm trying to get across is anything that God has ever said that is positive for you is a blessing. And all it takes is for you to put faith in that to release this power and start receiving it. You know, for time's sake, let me just refer to this. But over in the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis, well, let me back up just a little bit. In the 12th chapter is where Abraham came on the scene. And God told him in Genesis chapter uh, 12, verse 2, he says, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Now that, he didn't bless him at that exact moment. He said, I will bless you. And as you go on through the life of Abraham, God just kept increasing it, saying every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, I'm giving it to you. If you can count the stars in the sky, number the grains of sand on your seashore, so shall your seed be. All families of the earth will be blessed in you. 
That was a reference to his seed, Jesus coming and redeeming the entire earth. And God just kept speaking positive things over Abraham. And because of it, Abraham started out with nothing and became one of the wealthiest men of his day, so much so that kings came out and said, depart, your wealth is greater than our entire nation because God spoke things over him. And then when God gave him his seed, Isaac, and in the 22nd chapter, he went to uh, offer Isaac. God said, you know, offer Isaac as a sacrifice unto me. And Abraham was willing to do it. He actually lifted the knife and God stopped him. An angel stopped him and there was a ram caught by his horns in the thicket. And God gave him that as a sacrifice. And then the Lord told him, he says, you know, from this time forth, now I know that, man, you love me, you honor me, and you didn't hold anything back from me. And in blessing, I will bless you. You know, that's wordy to us and it doesn't mean anything, but God says, man, there is no end to the positive things I'm going to say over you. And God started blessing him and blessing his seed. And then in the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis, his uh, grandchildren, Isaac's children, uh, were born and uh, they were twins. And in the womb, there was this conflict going on between these two kids. They were fighting even in the mother's womb. And so Rebecca prayed and asked the Lord, what's going on? And the Lord told her, says, there's two nations in you. And the elder is going to serve the younger. He passed the blessing on in, Genesis, in Galatians chapter 4. It says that this was a symbol and type of how it's not by your human effort. It's the grace of God that causes everything to happen. And he was illustrating that through these two children. And so he made Esau the older servant to the younger. And Rebecca believed him and she always honored Jacob, but Isaac actually liked Esau better and tried to pass the birthright on to him and the blessing of Abraham on to Esau. So the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis is where Isaac, he was old. He was about 110 years old. He actually lived to be 140 something. So he was very premature on this, but he says, I'm about to die and I can't see anymore. And he says, he said to his son Esau, go get me venison and make me that meal that I love and come in and let me eat it. And then my soul is going to bless you. <coughs> and Rebecca was in the house when Isaac told his son Esau that. And she always favored Jacob and she knew what God had spoken to her, that the elder was going to serve the younger. So Rebecca went and got Jacob and told him what Isaac had told Esau and says, hurry, go get me two lamb out of the flock and I'll kill them and I'll make this food that your father likes. And you go in and you pretend to be Esau and you steal his blessing from him. And Jacob says, well, what happens if he recognizes that it's not me? He was blind. He couldn't see him. But, you know, he says, what if he tells by my voice or something that I'm not Esau? And she says, look, I'm going to put the skin of the kids upon your hands and upon your arms and on the back of your neck so that if he feels you, you'll feel like your brother Esau. That was one hairy guy <laughs> to have a fleece feel like him. And she also said, I'll give you his clothes so that you'll smell like him. Apparently, he was quite the fashion statement, amen. <laughs> and so anyway, they did this. And finally, Rebecca told him, says, look, if he finds out your curse will come upon me, I'll accept your curse for you. But that's how much she wanted him to get the blessing. And so Jacob did all of this and he went in and lied to his father and deceived him. His father felt him and he says, well, the voice is Jacob's but the hands are the hands of Esau. And so he blessed him in the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis. Here's my point. How many of you would have fought with your siblings when you left home to get your father's blessing? See, we don't think that way. There are many of you that when it was time to go, maybe your parents didn't agree and you said, who cares what you think? You're gone. You didn't think about getting a blessing. We don't think this way. It's not a big deal in our Western culture, but in the Bible, which we ought to conform our culture to the Bible, not the other way around. 
In the Bible, the blessing of the parent was super, super, super important. Even God the Father spoke a blessing over his son when he came and got baptized. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus hadn't done a single miracle. The Father spoke a blessing over him. You may not have been taught this, but I tell you, blessings are powerful. And especially coming from God. But these two boys were willing to fight. And when Esau found out that Jacob had stolen his blessing, he wanted to kill him. I mean, it was a contentious thing. What, the reason I bring this out is to show you that a blessing is powerful. We may not think that way, but that's because our thinking is wrong. We need to conform ourselves to the word. The word says death and life are in the power of your words. And when Esau finally came in and said, Father, here's the food, rise up and eat it so that you can bless me. Isaac said, who are you? And he said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. And he said, he says, Jacob came and stole away your blessing. And then Esau began to cry. It said he lifted up his voice and wailed and says, don't you have a blessing for me? And he said, I have already blessed your brother and I can't change it. He is blessed. He will be blessed. And then in the next chapter, the 28th chapter is where Jacob had this experience and he had a dream with a ladder going up to heaven and God was at the top of the ladder and God spoke to him and placed the blessing of Abraham on him. He didn't have to lie and steal and cheat to get it. He got it in the next chapter in a vision between him and God. But the reason I bring all this out is to show how much they believed in the power of a blessing. I tell you, brothers and sisters, we need to change the way we think because most of us don't see it this way. But if you understood this and you started taking this as this is a list of all of the blessings that God has spoken over us. Deuteronomy 28 is 14 verses of blessings that you're blessed coming in, you're blessed going out. You're above only, you're not beneath. You're the head and you're not the tail. Psalms chapter 91 is all of the blessings that'll come over us. And there's just blessing after blessing written all through here. We need to start understanding this and saying, Father, you said this. You bless me and start putting importance in words. You know, when the Lord was first showing me this, it's been 20 something years ago. There was a man in our church. His name was uh, Ralph and he was a greeter at our church. And he was kind of a short guy. He was about 70 years old, but he was just a happy guy. He loved everybody and every person that came in, he would hug them. One time we had a bunch of hell's angels come to our church. There was about 15 or 20 of them. And there was this big old guy, must've weighed 300 pounds. Ralph couldn't have been over 120 or 30. And he walks up and sees this huge biker with nothing but a vest on, tattoos all over and no shirt underneath his vest. And he looked up at this guy and he says, well, everybody's got to go sometime. And he just reached up and hugged him, <laughs> told this guy, glad you're here. He went down front, came forward and got born again in the service. Turned out he was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list for murder or something. Ralph nearly passed out when he came out. <laughs> but anyway, Ralph was just this guy. He was a great guy. And he was gone from church three weeks in a row. And I found out he had been sick. And then the next week I came back, he wasn't there. And finally the third week he wasn't there. And I just felt impressed to go over and minister to him. Turned out he had had pneumonia. He had been in the hospital. And they had let him out of the hospital. But he still had all of this phlegm that was in his chest. And he could barely breathe. He could hardly stand up and walk from the table to the bathroom or something. Because he, he just didn't have any lung capacity. He was full of all of this stuff. And so anyway, I went over to talk to him and he says, man, I just don't understand it. I know it's God's will for me to be healed. I've prayed. I've gotten better. But he says it just is hanging on. And this was when the Lord was showing me the power of a blessing. And death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I said, Ralph, I'm going to pray over you. And what I did was cut my hands like this and I put my mouth down to his chest. And I started talking to his chest based on... Uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, say to your mountain, be removed. Don't talk to God about your mountain, but talk to your mountain about God. Instead of asking God to do it as if you have no authority and power, take your power and reckon, 
Man, I wish I had the words to make this clear to you, but there is death and life in the power of your tongue. Your tongue is a powerful weapon if it's mixed with faith. The problem is we speak so many foolish, idle words, we don't even believe our words. But if you can understand this and retrain yourself, there is life in your words. Raising from the dead power in your words. And so I cut my hands over his chest and I spoke and I said, lungs in the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed. I command all of this phlegm that's in his lungs to loosen and to come out of there now. And I blessed him and I cursed the pneumonia and said, you're dead. Cursed it, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I cursed the sickness, spoke life over him. And did you know while I was praying, he had to push me away because he started coughing and he went and got a towel. And I mean, in 10 minutes, he coughed up all of this junk out of his lungs and he was normal in 10 minutes time. He had been dealing with that for three weeks. But there's power in your words if you believe it. The problem is we've, con we've confused our own heart. You stand there and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. And your heart thinks, is he kidding about this one the way he is about everything else? Is this like I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock and that means 7.30? What makes these words different than any other words? But you can get to a place where you believe the words you say. You don't say anything. You know... If you want me, if you want a compliment from me, you, you probably shouldn't come fishing for one. I've had women come up before and say, do you think this dress makes me look fat? They just shouldn't ask me things like that. <laughs> I am at least kind enough to say, uh, you know, that's really not my ex. This fragile feeling, a constant ache in my chest. Like a glass heart beating Longing for a place to rest Tired of masks, curated facades we show Yearning for a connection, someone to truly know But the world keeps spinning, it's dizzy A kaleidoscope of lies Empty promises and filter skies Is this what it means to be alive in this digital age? Trapped in the reflection of our own self-made cage This fragile feeling A constant ache in my chest Like a glass heart beating Longing for a place to rest Tired of masks Curated facades we show Yearning for a connection Someone to truly know But the world keeps spinning It's dizzy Is within my own reflection Finding the strength to shatter This digital deception To embrace the cracks, the flaws The beauty unforeseen 